Let's try that again. Your Grace, Bishop Christophoros, Father Maximus, Reverend Fathers, distinguished guests, family and friends. Good evening. My name is Evagelos Sotiropoulos, and I want to welcome you. It's a great honor to do so to this be beautiful church of St. Nicholas here in Scarborough. With the blessings of His Eminence, Metropolitan Sotirios, we're very fortunate and blessed to have our second annual Lenten spiritual homily that will be delivered this, uh, this evening by Father Maximus on the subject of our thoughts and mental health, an orthodox perspective. Just as a short housekeeping matter, our Paris Council will distribute small sheets of paper in the next few minutes for the question and answer session that will follow the homily. Feel free to write any questions that you may have and we'll circulate that. I think they're coming uh, right there. Um, feel free to write any questions and we'll circulate that for the Q&A following Father's homily. I would like to now call upon Father Fanurios, our parish priest here at St. Nicholas, to introduce our keynote speaker and our distinguished guest. Thank you. Θεοφιλέστατε, πανοσυλλογιότατοι, δεσιμολογιότατοι, αγαπητοί μου αδελφοί, αγαπητά παιδιά, όπως το παγωμένο δέντρο, ειδικά στον Καναδά, επιζητεί τον ανοιξιάτικο ήλιο, όπως το ξεραμένο λουλούδι επιζητεί το δροσερό νερό της βροχής, όπως το πεινασμένο στομάχι επιζητεί το ψωμί, όπως το πουλί επιζητεί την φωλιά του, έτσι ακριβώς κατά τον ίδιο τρόπο θεοφιλέστατε η ψυχή μας επιζητεί εν μέσω ακριβώς αυτής της ευλογημένης περίοδου της Μεγάλης Τεσσαρακοστής, επιζητεί τον ζεστό ήλιο, την δροσερή βροχή, την τροφή της, αυτή η ψυχούλα μας που τόσο πεινάει και τόσο διψάει και τόσο λησμονούμε την φροντίδα της και τόσο θυμόμαστε όμως την ανάγκη της αυτή την περίοδο, την ευλογημένη της Μεγάλης Σαρακοστής. Και αυτό είναι ο λόγος, θεοφιλέστατε, που νομίζω και αισθάνομαι και πιστεύω ότι μοιραζόμαστε την ίδια αίσθηση και την ίδια ανάγκη, την ίδια πείνα και την ίδια δίψα και αυτό είναι που μας έφερε όλους απόψε εδώ συναγμένους, μαζεμένους, σαν μία ομάδα ανθρώπων με, με, με την ίδια ανάγκη, την ίδια πείνα και την ίδια ψυχική δίψα. Αυτή την πείνα και αυτή την δίψα, πανοσολογιότατε, ήρθατε να συμπληρώσετε και να πληρώσετε απόψε και ευχαριστούμε και ευλογούμε τον Θεό για την παρουσία σας που σας έχουμε στον ευλογημένο Ναό του Αγίου Νικολάου για να ξεστομίσετε εις ημάς λόγων παρηγορητικών, λόγων θεολογικών, ακαδημαϊκών, λόγων προσευχητικών. Για να μπορέσουμε από τα χείλη σας να πάρουμε ίσως λίγη από την τροφή που χρειαζόμαστε για να φτάσουμε και να ολοκληρώσουμε το ταξίδι της Μεγάλης Τεσσαρακοστής. Έτσι λοιπόν τη ευλογία και τη σεπτία δία του Σεβασμιωτάτου Ποιμενάρχου μας, σας έχουμε απόψε εδώ. Σας καλωσορίζουμε στον Καναδά, στο Τορόντο και στον Άγιο Νικόλαο και αναβοώμεν όλοι μαζί ομοφόνος το ΕΦ παρέστητε. Καλωσορίσατε, Πανασολογιώτατε. Θα διαβάσω μόνο στα αγγλικά το βιογραφικό σας σημείωμα. The very reverend father Maximus Constas is a senior research scholar at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. 
He holds a PhD in patristics and historical theology from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. For many years, he was a professor at Harvard Divinity School, after which he became a monk at Simonopetra at Mount Athos. He is the author of The Art of Seeing, Paradox and Perception in Orthodox Iconography, an edition and translation of Maximus the Confessor's Ambigua, and Proclus of Constantinople and the Cult of the Virgin in Late Antiquity, as well as numerous articles and translations. His work focuses on the patristic and Byzantine theological tradition, orthodox spirituality, the history of the reception of biblical and patristic sources in the late Byzantine era, and the theological study of Byzantine art, icons, and iconography. Archimandrit Father Maximus was ordained deacon on the Feast of San Nicholas in 2015, and shortly after was ordained a priest. Both ordinations were presided over by Archbishop Geron Dimitrios of America. Panosiologiotate, echete ton logon. Your Grace, it's good to see you again. Uh, Father, thank you for those uh, kind words of uh, introduction. And uh, Vangeli, I don't see him. I'm sure he's there he is, managing certain things. Uh, thank you for your uh, hospitality and for helping arrange uh, this uh, event. Of course, uh, I am happy to begin by thanking uh, His Eminence, Metropolitan uh, Sotirios, who, because of other uh, business, could not be here with us uh, this evening. But I would like to publicly thank him for this opportunity and uh, for his friendship and for his uh, support uh, over the years. Some of you might remember that I was here, uh, was it a year ago? I don't remember exactly, uh, but for the, there was an event in this church actually. And it's, very, it's a blessing to uh, be back. As Father uh, Fanurios uh, mentioned, uh, I, was I was ordained uh, to the diaconate and the priesthood on the feast day, while well, I was ordained a, a deacon on the feast day of uh, Saint uh, Nicholas, and before I became a monk and received the name of Maximus, uh, my name, my baptismal name was Nicholas. So uh, it's a double blessing for me to be in this church of Saint Nicholas. I mean, I, I've been to your church before, but this is the first time that I've been here for an actual service. And it's, it's such a lovely environment. It's such a beautiful environment. It's such a peaceful environment that I feel a little, I'm a little reluctant to shatter the silence uh, of the beautiful Vesper service uh, with my words, but this is what you've invited me here to do, and uh, that's what I will uh, do. And uh, uh, as you heard, I've been asked to say a few words about the whole question or the whole problem of our thoughts. Now, thoughts in English, I mean, means one thing, I suppose, but in, in Greek, uh, there's a very specific word here, logizmi. It's not skepsis, it's logizmi. So the thoughts that we're talking about here are logizmi, which are, which are a very particular kind of mental phenomenon, let's say. They're not thoughts uh, that we ordinarily have. They're something very uh, different. And often they're translated as negative thoughts. Logizmi can often be translated as uh, negative thoughts or thoughts that emerge or arise from our passions. And we'll say more about what uh, the passions uh, uh, are. Or if the, if the logizmi are not coming from passions, they are leading us to the passions. The logizmi opi mas prothun kata kapio dropo, prostina martia ke prostapathi. So those are the kinds of thoughts that we uh, uh, are going to be speaking about this evening. Is there a problem or? Can everyone hear me? Am I audible or? It sounds good from where I'm standing, so. I flew up from Boston uh, this morning and uh, my head is a little stuffed from uh, the air travel. 
So I hope you can hear me a little better than I can hear myself. Well, it seems, it seems fair to say, it seems clear to say that we, we live, and this is really, I mean, it's our curse and it's our blessing. We live in a troubled world. We live in a troubled world. It's hard to turn on the news or look at a newspaper or, uh, and, not, and not be upset, not be uh, unsettled. Zume se mia etsi taragmeni epochi sema taragmeno cosmo. And the, the, the source of, of, of the troubles that we see, the origin of the troubles that we see, the root of the troubles that we see is our own, is our own troubled self. Right? All, everything that we see externally, everything that we see outwardly in the world is a manifestation, is a projection of the things that we have within us. If there is greed within us, if there is hatred within us, if there is resentment within us, if there is anger within us, if there is whatever it is, this is what will be manifested within the world. So I can only attribute the troubled nature of our world today to the troubled nature of the self, to our own inner, I mean, it's our own inner turmoil that has been projected out into the world, uh, uh, into the things that we see. Και το λέει ο Απόστολος Παύλος, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ο Απόστολος Ιάκωβος. In the letter of James, James asks the question, what is the source of the wars and the conflicts among you? Is it not your lusts? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? In other words, in your own self. You desire and you do not have, so you kill. And you covet but you cannot obtain, so you fight and you wage war. Pothen polemi, apo pou i polemi, ke pothen mache en imin, apo pou in afta, ou vlepo me mesa mas, ou ken defen, den in apo ki, ek ton idonon nimon, ton stratevomenon en dismeles in nimon. Epithimite, ke ou ke ekite, thelete, dilidi, thelete pramata, ke den da ekite, ou ke ekite, ke fonevete, ke ta exis pou ta le o apostolos. So we're distracted by things around us. I mean, we're distracted by the news and by the troubled times that we live in and all of the unusual and disturbing things that we see. And I think this is, this is a dangerous thing for us because it distracts us from our own self. It distracts us from our own inner depth. And we end up living externally. We end up living superficial, superficially and not from our own inner depth. Somebody once said, I don't know the source of the quotation, but somebody once said that every, every depth has a surface, but not every surface has a depth, which is why we should attend to the depth of things and not to the surface, right? Kathe vathos echi epifania, ala kathe epifania den echi vathos. Y afto na prosexume ochi στις επιφάνειες, αλλά στο βάθος, στα βάθη των πραγμάτων, έτσι. Γιατί καμιά φορά η επιφάνεια είναι απάτη, είναι απάτη. So, this is, I think, part of the Christian life, part of the spiritual life, and not even just part of the Christian or the spiritual life, but it's part of a normal and a healthy, I think, human life, a normal, human, healthy, psychological, emotional, and spiritual life does not involve being externally oriented all the time and living outside of yourself and being distracted and reactive and all these kinds of things, but it means to live from your center. It means to live from your inner depth, to live richly and deeply and with deliberation from your own self and not to be at the mercy of, right? What's the... I don't know the, the, the quoting, but the, the, the reed that's blown about uh, by, by every wind of change that comes through. We, we can't be that person. We can't be that person. We have to have an inner uh, stability. But we have a problem. We have a problem when we try to enter into ourselves. We have a problem when we try to move from the external to the internal, from the outward to the inner. And what is that problem? That problem is, is that our minds our minds are easily distracted. Our minds are easily uh, distracted. We often find it difficult to pay attention for more than a few minutes. We often find it difficult to pay attention. Uh, 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 as can be seen, for example, in the precipitous rise 
of various uh, attention deficit disorders, which were lar largely unheard of five or 10 or 15 years ago. And now, and now uh, millions of people of all kinds of ages now, not simply children or adolescents, but older and older people are being diagnosed with attention deficit uh, disorder and, and, and related kinds of uh, disorders. This is, this is a disorder that's not, it's uh, ADD, ADHD, is not caused by a virus, right? It's a social uh, problem. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a, a genetic or a, a chromosomal or a viral. It's not caused by a microbe or. It's a social disorder. And of course, if you raise, if you put children in environments where they're distracted by all kinds of electronic gadgets and are, of course, they're going to have a hard time focusing. Of course, they're going to have a hard time uh, concentrating and uh, focusing. And we. We. But we have this. Weakness, ο νους του ανθρώπου έχει αυτή την αδυναμία ότι δεν μπορεί να προσέχει, δεν, δεν στέκεται, δεν, στέκεται, δεν κάθεται, δεν αναπαύεται. Right? There's this, we have this, we're always seeking something. The mind is always in motion, the mind is always striving, seeking, searching, demanding, wanting, craving. I mean, most of us have televisions probably with remote controls and other gadgets that give us access to maybe more than 100 channels and you can sit there and channel surf that's the phrase right and go through hundreds and still not find anything worth watching or you go to we go to our refrigerators and our refrigerators are filled with food and there's nothing in there for us to eat or you go to i don't know netflix to find a movie and you spend 25 minutes looking for a movie to watch and you don't find anything Right? So all of this excess, all of this abundant, abundance actually doesn't fulfill us, but it actually leaves us feeling more empty. A refrigerator full of food and there's nothing to eat. A television full of movies and there's nothing to watch. I mean, talepori maste. Talepori en arti katastasis. And all of this searching, all of this craving, all of this wanting, all of this restlessness, and we never seem to ask ourselves, what are we seeking? Right? We never, we just accept the fact that we're craving creatures, that we're looking, searching, striving, wanting, never happy, never satisfied, never always want. We never ask ourselves why or what, what exactly are we looking for? Why are we so restless? Why are we always searching? Why do we, why we, I mean, take the channel surfing as a metaphor or an allegory for your life, right? How come you can't find that the channel that's supposed to be your life? Why is it all right? It's this built-in kind of discontent or uh, unhappiness. Uh, Why is it so hard for us to remain quietly at home? Why is it so hard for us to remain at home, let's say, in our, in our room? Why is it so difficult for us to take a solitary walk without the gadgets and the telephones and the earbuds and that, right? Why do we find it so difficult? To do? What prevents us from being at rest? What prevents us from being at rest? Why are we so restless? Why are we, so, we simply accept the fact of our restlessness. We never question it. And I think we need to. <clears throat> Another question, why are we so enamored? Uh, earlier I spoke about the depth and the surface, the vathos and the epiphania, right? The depth and the surface. Why are we so enamored of surfaces? Why are we so enamored of surfaces. We have become very superficial people. It's all about appearances, right? Whether it's politics, whether it's in our own self-presentation to other people, we look, we, we seem to be fixated, focused on, enamored of, obsessed with surfaces, surfaces, the way things look, not the way things are. And we're easily deceived time and again by surface appearances. Even in relationships, we look at people and we see the surface of them. We fall, sometimes people fall in love with other people because of the way their eyebrows look or because of the color of their hair, right? Or some other superficial physical characteristic that brings people together, but there's, there's no foundation for a relationship there, right? The surface is just the surface. And we, it used to be an old saying, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. But that's exactly the kind of society we've become. I'm not Canadian, I'm not from Canada, I'm, I'm, I, think, I think maybe what I'm saying is more relevant to the U.S., where I think where America is supposed to be ahead of Canada all the time, and we're certainly ahead of you in terms of being superficial and shallow in terms of our culture and our aesthetics and our politics and many other things. So much of what I'm saying 
comes from an American uh, kind of background, but I think it's also a very human problem, a very human problem. And my question is, why are we so enamored of the surface? Why are we so attached to surfaces? And one possible answer could be is that we're, it's because we're afraid of the depth. We're afraid. Fovo mastetovathos. Fovo mastetovathos. Masikano pi, kapia epifania, kapia exoteriki epifania, ke arkia afto to prama. Na ino reo, na ino kalo, na ino apolastiko. To vathos omos, miskalizis. So, so maybe we're afraid of the depth, right? Maybe we're afraid of our own inner depth, right? which maybe we've never encountered it. Maybe we've never, maybe we don't know who we are very well. And rather than get into that, we'll satisfy ourselves with superficial and external uh, distractions. Still worse, still worse than being afraid of the depth. Maybe we're afraid of finding out that we don't have a depth. That if I've spent my whole life attending to external superficial things, my face and my hair and my appearance and my clothing and the details of my home and so on and so on, right? All of these exoterica pramata, right? Maybe, uh, maybe I've neglected, I mean, my own inner depth. Και αυτό δεν θέλω να κοιτάξω λιγάκι μέσα. Ή ας πούμε, να μην βλέπω ή τα χάλια ή το τίποτα. Το κενό που υπάρχει μέσα στη ψυχή μου. Και αυτό μας φοβερίζει. Αυτό μας φοβερίζει. Να, to look inside of yourself. It's, it's, it's one thing to look inside of yourself and see something you're not happy with. Okay. But it's another thing to look inside of yourself and, and, and realize that you're empty. That's a frightening thing. That's a frightening thing. And I think our lives are very empty living in a materialistic and consumeristic and sort of science, scientific kind of culture where everything is reduced to physical phenomena. Δεν υπάρχει πια το πνεύμα. Μόνο το υλικό, η εξωτερική υλική επιφάνεια των πραγμάτων. So, this idea of the restless, this kind of restless mind that we have, okay, this I think is, this is, a, this is a human dilemma. It's a human existential kind of a pro, pro, uh, problem. And it's been exacerbated by our modern society, by our modern uh, culture. Why? Because there's a very real sense in which the culture that we've created, the culture that we've created, I'm thinking primarily of digital culture and all of the electronic gadgets. I think I see someone in the back holding up an electronic gadget. I mean, they're everywhere. People, right? Not, not, it's not singling you out, but right? this, the culture that we have created is really a culture of organized distractions. Right? How can you possibly have a deep inner spiritual life if you're constantly distracted by the 24-hour news cycle every 15 minutes every day there's some new story there's some new event there's some new disruption there's some chaotic all right and it seems that the whole thing has been designed to distract us one day it's the missing airplane the next day it's some virus the next day it's some attack and and, and who's and it's in the interest of certain groups and, and others to keep us distracted from the depth of things and to keep us satisfied with uh, superficial things. That's a whole other issue. I'm not going to get into it. But it's not by chance that society has evolved in this way. It's to someone's advantage that we're uh, being kept distracted and that we've been made and that we're not encouraged to look uh, within ourselves. So if we think for a moment about what our mind is doing most of the time. Now, there's a lot of people here in the church tonight, and uh, I've been speaking for uh, maybe 10 minutes or so, and you might, you might want to take a, a quick self-check and ask yourself where you've been in those 10 minutes. Right? Have, 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 you all, are you all, have you even arrived here yet? Some of you still haven't gotten to physically you're here, but spiritually, mentally, maybe you're still at home, maybe you're still at work, Maybe you're thinking about a conversation you had, or maybe you, maybe you got here, body and soul, but then now you're thinking about, okay, I have to, you know, I hope he, I hope he finishes quickly because I, I haven't had my coffee this afternoon, or I've got to make dinner, right? Alos pigues to Parisi, ξέρω εγώ, right? Spania είμαστε παρόντες. Spania είμαστε, δεν είμαστε παρόν, παρόντες. So either, if you think about it, either 
all of the, the, the activity of the mind, it's always moving, it's always in motion, it's always filled with thoughts and memories and images and anxieties and fears and resentments. And think of all of that turmoil that goes on inside of us. And either, either we're mulling about things that happened yesterday, what they said in the office yesterday, or what my cumbaro said the other day, or what's going to, right? All, all of, not to pare el fondos, right? All of that puede conquini. Either we're mulling about things in the past, going all the way back to my childhood. What did my parents do, or my grandparents, or where I was born, and what opportunity? I, it never ends. It's, it's sort of like a cassette tape or a videotape that just plays over and over and over and over and over in our mind. So either we're worrying about mulling over things that happened yesterday, or we're anxious about tomorrow, right? right? What's going to happen with this and that and the other thing? And so if you think about it, we're, we're, we're sort of torn in two directions, right? Either we're worried about the past or resentful about the past or daydreaming about the past, people that we knew, places that we went, or we're focused on uh, some sort of imaginary future. What if this? What if that? How about this? How about that? And it turns out that we are all, almost never in the present. We are absent from the present. And, and we know what that's like. You know what it's like when you, when you have a problem and you want to talk to someone, even a friend, and they're not there. They're not present. They're not listening to you because they, they're distracted by things. You know how to, and we do that to them too. They're telling you their problem, right? 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 But to be absent from the present, I mean, και ο Θεός που βρίσκεται, ούτε στις, στις σκέψεις μας για το παρελθόν, ούτε στο, στο, στο φανταστικό μέλλον που φανταζόμαστε, ο Θεός βρίσκεται στο παρόν. Και αν εμείς δεν είμαστε παρόντες στο παρόν, δεν είμαστε με το Θεό. So if, if I'm living in my past, if I'm pining over my lost youth and how handsome I used to be and how I used to be able to run 10 miles and the friends that I had and the places that I went and how, or if I'm worried about the future, where am I, I don't have enough money to retire or where am I going to live and what happens if there's a, an economic recession. Or I, if I'm living in the past or the future, I'm not living in the present. And God exists only in the present. God does not exist in my memories of the past. And God does not exist in my daydreams and my fantasies about the future. So if all I'm doing is mulling over the past and imagining things about the future, I'm not in the present. And that means I'm not with God. I'm not with God. God is not the God of my imaginary, of my imagination, of my thoughts, of my memories, of my resentments. Theos is to paron. Yeah, as I said before, and if we're absent from the present, we're absent from uh, God. I mean, think about it. Even when we're sleeping, our minds are active. I mean, this tamatai on us to anthropo. Kepopu afti kinesi, afti tarahi, afti energy, afti. Then I'm not bothered. They're on us meti pota. So uh, I think. I think most of us, though, it happens that I think most of us are so distracted most of the time that we don't really have a sense of what's going, going on inside of us. From the, minute, from the minute we wake up in the morning, I mean, most of us now, from what I understand, people, the first thing, <laughs> excuse me, people do is they reach for their iPhone. They say the last thing you touch at night and the first thing you touch in the morning is your iPhone, right? right? Sort of like it's like that, that creature in the Lord of the Rings, Gollum, who had, with the ring, it's like my precious, my precious, he couldn't, right? He couldn't be apart from the iPhone, right? So which means all, all of our waking time, all of our waking time is spent hooked up to some sort of gadget or device or, or you're emailing or you're texting or you're tweeting or you're on the computer or you're binge watching or you're on the phone. <clears throat> we're, all, we're, we're constantly distracted. We're constantly living outside of ourselves. Because I said, we seem to be afraid to actually be alone. We seem to be afraid to not have these things on. Actually, a long time ago, Sigmund Freud, the famous uh, uh, psychologist, 
uh, noticed, because in those days they had radio, he noticed that when, the moment that people walked into a room, they put the radio on. That was the first thing they did. They walked into the room, they put the radio on. And I see this today. People get home from work, the first thing they do, put the TV on or the radio or something else. You know, you know what Freud said about that? He said, why do they do that? He says, they do, or you go to the car, the first thing, put that, right? Yeah, God, God forbid there's a two minute period where there isn't some distraction. Freud's answer to that was, well, he's, he's because these people are, don't want to hear or confront their subconscious thoughts or impulses. Right? I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but I, I think that's generally right. Right? If we can't be alone with ourselves, that means we have a problem with ourselves. Either we don't like ourselves. Well, why should we be uncomfortable being alone in a solid, going for a solitary walk without the music and the gadgets and the why? Right? What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Right? So I think I think we're so distracted that we don't even realize what's going on inside of ourselves. And I think it's only now. I think it's sort of you know. Maybe when you're waiting online somewhere in the bank or something like that, or people don't even do that anymore. Let's say you're, you're trying to go to sleep at night and you're dozing off and you've turned off the iPhone and the TV is off and, and you're there by yourself now. And you're, now you start, oh, what's all of this? What are all these thoughts in my mind? Now you see them, right? They're not just there at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night when you're going to sleep. That's going on all the time. And I think we're, we're running away from that and we're, we're distracting ourselves with all of the gadgets and the music and the noise and the binge watching and the constant checking of the email and the tweets and the, the text messages. And, right? But you see, there are moments when you hear right, all of that internal noise. And some of us can't sleep at night because of that. Right? All of those thoughts, all of that anxiety, all of that turmoil, all of that... All right? It, it can, and you want to, and it's not, it's not an exaggeration. It can be torture. It can be torture. Wh whoever has had a sleepless night knows just how awful that is to not be able to sleep because your mind is racing because of, sometimes the concerns are real. Sometimes that, you know, I'm, I, I lost my job today. All right. Right. But all, more often than not, the concerns are, are either imaginary or they're magnified by uh, our uh, mind. And we know the, the power that, that these thoughts have. I mean, I can, I can think of, I mean, uh, th th there might be someone that I don't like. There might be someone that I, don't, I have a problem with, a family member or a colleague or a neighbor or someone like this. And we know there's an issue there. And if that, if that person comes to my mind, all of a sudden that person's face, let's say, or just the memory of them comes to my mind, I know that my, my blood pressure can start to rise. I can become physically upset just by the thought of someone. And if I allow myself to, if I indulge in that thought, in that, I can become, I, I can actually become angry. I start remembering the negative things I think they did to me, right? They said this to me and they did that to me and, you know, that gets me mad now. And right? think of the, right? Right? The other side of all of this is what? Is that all of these thoughts are, very, are fragmenting, are fragmenting. I mean, if, if, we, if we have, if we're divided by all of the thoughts that we have in our mind, we're not whole beings. We're not whole creatures where we're, our mind is here, our mind is there. Look, if you're sitting here and your mind is somewhere else, you're fra that's fragmentation. That's a low-level form of psychological disassociation. You're having a low, let's say you're having a low-level out-of-body experience. You're here sitting in the church, but onusu puhi pai onus, right? Ine pote mazisu. Actually, uh, tonight and tomorrow we're celebrating Saint John uh, uh, Climacus, Saint John of the Ladder, who's a, a church father and abbot of the. Monastery of St. Catherine's at uh, Sinai, who wrote a book called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. That's why they call him St. John of the Ladder. And he's somewhere in the ladder. He says, you know, he goes, if you could stay inside your body for one day, you, you, you can be saved. Right? Amboris na kathese ke na mini psichisu mesa sto soma su ya mia mera. He might even say mia ora. Asothis. 
right? But are we, are, are, is soul and body united for 24 hours? I, I mean, that's, that's hard to, we, look, you can't even say one single Jesus prayer without being distracted. Uterna. Uterna kiri Jesu Christe eleisome dhe boris na pis, choris diaspasmo, choris perispasmo. Pos ta ginen 24 horas meta, otan uti jena defterolepto dhe bori o antropus na singendrothi, ke na meni, as pume, mesa sto ne aftotu. Peta i psiki ke pa e opetheli. And I think when we do see the inner turmoil, when we do see the distractions, when we do have the sleepless nights, when we do hear the noise uh, and the anger and the resentment and the daydreaming, and when we do catch glimpses of this, it's there all the time, but we distract ourselves, like I said. When we do, uh, when we do see some of these things inside of us, you know, it can be very, uh, it can be very disorienting, it can be very uh, confusing, and it can be very frightening. Right, to get a glimpse, in other words, of your inner darkness, right? because everyone has some darkness in them, right? and we pretend it's not there, or we think it's going to go away, or other people see it, we don't see it, right? but it's there. And when you see it, it can be very upsetting, it can be very disturbing. For example, if you're sitting in church during, during, uh, on Sunday, and, uh, and, and a negative thought enters into your mind, Περνάει μια βλάσφημία στο μυαλό σου, μέσα στο ναό. Δεν το ήθελες, δεν το ζήτησες. Δεν σ' αρέσει καθόλου αυτό το πράγμα. Αλλά σου έρχεται αυτός ο άσκημος λογισμός. Μια βλάσφημία. Από πού είναι αυτό το πράγμα. So you think, okay, και ποιος είμαι εγώ που σκέφτομαι έτσι. Από πού είναι αυτά. So, uh, like I said, the blasphemous thought that comes, or the angry thought, or the violent thought, or the dark kind of sexual thought, or all of these things that pass through our minds, right? A person can see those things and become very confused, become very frightened by them, and not, and, and they might think they're, they're having some sort of a problem, right? But, uh, uh, which, is why, which is why we need to know what is going on inside of ourselves. We need to know that. We need to know where all of this comes from. What is the cause of all of this inner turmoil? What does it all mean? And how are we supposed to respond to it? What does one do? Having seen some of these things in myself now, βλέποντας τα δικά μου τα χάλια, τους δικούς μου τους λογισμούς, τα πάθη, τις αμαρτίες, τις νησικακίες και όλα αυτά που έχουμε μαζί, πώς πρέπει να απαντήσω τώρα εγώ, τι είναι σωστή αντιμετώπιση αυτής της κατάστασης. Αυτό είναι το μυστήριο. Και αυτό είναι το μυστήριο της ζωής. Γιατί αν, εάν δεν μπορεί ο άνθρωπος να παλέψει σωστά με αυτή την κατάσταση, δεν μπορεί να, δεν μπορεί να προχωρήσει. Right? Why? Because, so if we, don't, if we don't know how to face ourselves, in a sense, and the situation that we have, we can never make progress in the spiritual life. Why? Because th these are the things that hold us back. Right? Because if, if every time I think of you, or you, or you, I get angry, or if I remember what you did to me, or what you said to me last year at Christmas, or when you didn't come to my house when I had Thanksgiving dinner, or whatever it was, if, if every time those thoughts enter my mind, I become angry and upset, and right, well, that means those are, those are the places where I'm not free. The, those are the places where I'm not free. <laughs> It's like you have a little dog and you have it on a rope and it's tied to the tree and the dog, it can kind of run around a little bit, but right? So I can think that I'm fine, right? But then all of a sudden, don't bring up this subject or don't talk about that one or because they know the right? I get to the end of my rope. And, those, and that's where I learn. those are the places where I'm not free. I'm not free. And I, I have no joy because of this. It ruins everything. It ruins me. It ruins my relationships with others. So I have to, I have to know what's uh, going on. So let's maybe just spend a couple of minutes and, and enter, into, enter a little more deeply into uh, uh, some of the psychological and spiritual dynamics that are uh, operative here. Now, the first thing to say is that, you know, human beings are very complex creatures. We're very complex creatures. They say the most complicated thing in the universe by far, right? It's not, it's not anything in the solar system or in the galaxy. It's the human brain, 
right? Just on a strictly physiological level, on a strictly neurological level, the human brain is the most complex and complicated thing that human beings know. And we, we know very little about it. We're still learning about it. And the funny thing is that when we try, when neurologists and psychologists and others try to learn about the brain, it's the brain trying to figure the brain out, right? Because it's the brain of the psychologist or the brain of the neurologist trying to figure out essentially his own brain. So you wonder, can that even be done? It's kind of, it's a little bit too self-referential to reach a kind of a, of a conclusion. But the truth of it is that our experience of the world is extremely, we experience the world in complex ways. We're not like little earthworms that, that see light and dark and heat and cold and react to them. Our responses to the world, the way we look at the world, the way we perceive the world, the way we take in the world is extremely complex. And it's not simply uh, on the level of the senses, like a camera takes a picture of something because it takes in the external source of light and it records the image. Well, the eye kind of works like that, but the camera doesn't have a mind, camera doesn't have feelings, camera doesn't have a memory, right? So we have all the optical machinery in a way, but we bring this whole emotional and cognitive and spiritual world to that act of uh, perception. So we take things in from the world around us and we form uh, ideas about them. I've been up here now for 20 minutes and m many of you will have formed ideas about me by seeing me, by hearing me, by right? All, this is the way the mind works. We make judgments, we make decisions, we size people up, we measure things up, we, right? Now, all of that could be wrong because how can you say you know me? Maybe you're seeing me now for the first time, but we do that, all right. So the, the fathers of the church, <laughs> the saints of the church make a basic distinction, which I think is helpful between prag, pragmata and noimata. Pragmata, the Greek word pragma, plural pragmata. In modern Greek, we use it to mean things, but it also means realities or objects. So there are things in the world. There are trees, there are houses, there are people, there are automobiles, there are pragmata in the world. But there are also what the church fathers call noimata, from noima, right? To noimata, ta noimata, and the word nous, you can hear that word in there as well. So noimata are sort of the mental representations of the pragmata, right? The, the noimata are sort of the mental images that we form about things in the world. So a, a simple example, let's say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little child. I don't know a whole lot about the world because I was only born a short while ago. I'm still learning. And I go into the kitchen, I'm, I'm just learning how to walk. I go, I go into the kitchen, there's an oven there. I have no idea what an oven is. I've never seen an oven before. And I go up and I put my hands on it. And the oven is on and it's hot and I, I, I burn my hands. I'm like, oh goodness, that's, that's an intense experience to have put your hands on the outside of the oven, All right? So a few days later, I'm back in the kitchen and I'm, maybe I'm not a very bright boy and I do the same thing again. And oh, right, they said it's the old proverb, once burnt, a lesson learned. Well, sometimes we need to be burnt multiple times to learn our lessons, right? But, but sooner or later, if that happens once or twice or three times, I will, for, from the pragma, of, which is the pragma here is the, 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 the hot oven, I will form the noima, the, the sort of general abstract idea in my mind now that, oh, well, ovens have a high possibility of being hot and uh, I better exercise caution around them. So you see now from, now not all ovens are hot, not all ovens even work, but now I have this idea that ovens are hot and I have to be careful around them. So you see what happens? We have simple experiences of physical sensations in the world, but we end up forming these ideas about them. We end up forming these noimata, ta noimata ton pragmaton, and there's a distinction between uh, the two of them. Now, <clears throat> this is a very simple idea because it involves heat and sensation and so on. Um, but, but most of the ideas that we uh, require are much more complex. Why? Because they're tied not to just the sensation of heat or cold, but they're tied to our feelings and our emotions and our whole selves and our uh, personality. I'll give you another example that the church fathers use. They say, I say gold, by gold they mean wealth, money, right? Gold, they say. To chrysotine, ina mia petra. Gold is just, gold is a mineral. Gold is nothing more than a mineral. There's nothing bad about it. There's nothing evil about it. There's nothing, it's just something that comes out of the ground, right? So the pragma, the thing is the gold. 
But I could, I, could, I could come to realize that if I have a lot of gold, I have maybe a little more power to buy things, let's say, and to uh, make myself look superior uh, to other people or to buy a bigger home or uh, to take trips that I can you know, uh, tell my friends about and have them see just how much money I have and I can get a big... They're all, think of the, the, the authority and the social status and the prestige and the, the power that the gold can so in my mind now right when i see gold i don't i don't see a mineral i don't see a mineral anymore i see right power uh uh, uh the ability to uh, uh impress other people and all of the things that i think that you see the difference another example that the church fathers use that the saints use is is a, is a beautiful face the face of a, uh, the beautiful face, uh, the face of a beautiful woman, or the face of a beautiful, that's just a face. That's just a human face. There's nothing inherently wrong or sinful about, about human beauty. But yet, I can, in my mind, develop uh, an image now, right? I can have the noima, right? Can become impassioned. I can become attached to particular kinds of faces. So that when I see this woman's face that I think is a beautiful face, I'm attracted to her, I open the door for her, I buy dinner for her, I'm, I'm talking to her. But there's another woman who doesn't conform to the image of beauty that I have in my mind, and I ignore her. Right? Now, it could be that the woman who I don't consider to be beautiful might actually be the better person. She might be the better wife, the better mother, uh, she, right? But I, don't pay, I, don't, I, I totally avoid her because she does not correspond to the noima, to the, to the mental, to this image that I have in my mind. And I, 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 I'm, I'm attracted instead to the other person who I think is beautiful or whose society tells me is beautiful. And that's the one I end up with. It turns out that I'm so blinded by my own ideas that I can't see that she's, she, she'll be a terrible wife and a terrible mother and she'll, right? She won't be faithful to me or whatever. But we don't see these things because our experience of reality is now interpreted by the ideas we have in our mind. Right? And, you know, wives have images of their husbands in their mind, and husbands have images of their wives in their minds, and parents have images of their children in their mind, and so on and so on and so on. Now, let me ask you something. If, if I'm relating to you, let's say, let's say there's a husband and a wife, or a wife and a husband, and let's say the wife is relating to her husband through that idea. She wants him to be a certain way. Don't do this, do that. This is how you should be. That's not how you should be. Right? That, that's not what good husbands do, etc. So if the, the wife is relating to the husband through the idea, right? and if the wife is doing that, or if the husband is doing that, or can the wife or the husband really be said, what is, what, what is the wife or the husband relating to? The, they're relating to the idea. So in a sense, there is no relation here. There is no relation here. If I'm relating to the people around me through the ideas that I have of them, right? Right? Oh, I, I don't tell me about her. I know all about her. Let me tell you what she did to me 25 years ago, right? Five minutes, 25 years ago, and I, you know, that's who she is, right? And if I re if I only relate to people through these images that I have in my mind. Am I really relating to people? Am I free, first of all? Am I even free? I'm not free. I'm bound. I'm enslaved to these images that I have in my mind that, 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 that interpret uh, my experiences uh, for me. And we know we have images of ourselves, too, you know. We relate to our own selves through similar images. So, for example, I could say, okay, myself, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know I have a PhD. I've read a million books. I'm very smart. And you, you know, and I expect you to treat me a certain way, right? I have a beard, I wear a robe. I expect to be treated with a certain level of respect when I come to your parish, and you have to put the carpet down on the floor for me because you have to spui me go, right? Right. So I, because why? Because I have this image of myself, and I, I, I think the whole world has to correspond now to. Now, what happens? You come along now. You say, "Pat and Daxi, ne mi omilia de 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 vas meto to chalaki de kriazite." Right now, I come to your church. You say, Father, I, we usually put the carpet out when the speakers come, but we're not going to put it put it out tonight for you. We just we just don't have the time. We're not going to do it. And what now? You, so you ju you've just come now, and you wounded me, you hurt me, you insulted me, you offended me. Right? But what did you actually 
of hurt or, or insult? Me or the idea of me? Right? Why should it matter to me if there's a, if there's a red carpet? Well, I don't know how we got onto the red carpet, but on the, on the carpet. So. <clears throat> Why should it matter to me why should it matter to me if there's a carpet here or not? Or why should it matter if someone didn't open the door when I thought they should? Or if they put me in a four-star hotel and not a five-star? You see what I mean? It's all because of this image that I have of myself. And, 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 and so on with the images that I have of others. And the simple solution, of course, is to be done with the image. Get rid of the, don't have the image. Let it go. Why should it matter if somebody bumps into you or disrespects you? So, so what? Really, τι έγινε, τι έγινε, right? Και ο άλλος δεν πονάει, ο άλλος δεν έχει το πρόβλημά του. Δεν ξέρω με σούμι γιατί μιλάει ο άλλος έτσι, right? Έχει το δικό του το πόνο. Right, but we always, we always, you know, all right, people do things, they say things, they have their own problems, they have their own pain, they have their own difficulty. Most of the times, they're not out to hurt us, they're, they're trying to protect themselves. Those are sort of self-defensive things where it's, you know, the boss yelled at them and they can't yell at the boss, so they yell at you. It's, it's all of this displaced anger that, right? And if all of us are so hypersensitive because of the images that we have, I mean, our life becomes, I mean, what it has uh, uh, become. All right. Um, you know, I, I read a test that was actually very disturbing. Uh, this has been replicated multiple times. Do you know that, that bet good-looking children, like in grammar schools, on the average, get better grades than the other kids. And it's not because they're smarter. It's because they're perceived to be better looking. And when uh, the good looking kid acts out and makes trouble, he's very easily forgiven. Oh, Johnny's just having a bad day, right? But if the not so good looking kid acts out or makes trouble, right? He's punished and scolded and sent home. And look at the way we, right? judge people and relate to people and respond to people based on something as superficial and as insignificant as their physical appearance. And we do it all the time. We do it all the time. Right? And it's, the, it's, the, it's Hollywood, it's the star culture, it's, it's, it's everything together that combines and colludes to create this uh, situation. Um, all right. Uh, there's, there's so many things that we can say. Uh, but we don't have uh, all night. Let's, um, w one last point that I wanted to add, because it is an important thing. You know, I, I, Elder Porphyrius used to say, now St. Porphyrius used to say, and I think last year you had uh, the uh, Yerondisa here who, from, the, from the monastery spoke. You know, he used to say that the devil will take a sensitive person and try to make that person hypersensitive. In other words, the devil will take a good quality that you have. The devil will take a good quality. It's good to be sensitive, by the way. You don't want to be unsensitive or insensitive, right? So the devil will try to take a good quality that you have and make it bad. So the devil will take a sensitive person and try to make that person hypersensitive. Hypersensitive is no good. Sensitive is nice. Sensitive is good. Hypersensitive, nobody likes hypersensitive. Right? So the devil, the devil actually tries to exploit our feelings and our emotions. I had, I had more to say about that, but I want to jump ahead and talk about uh, uh, what, how, more about how we, how we should respond to the situation that I've described. Well, one of the first mistakes we make is that, and I think this happens at a very young age, as children, certainly by the time we're teenagers, we make the mistake of self-identifying with all of the negative thoughts that we have inside of ourselves. Right? The anger, the resentment, the daydreaming, the, the fantasies, the lusts, all of these things that pass through our minds, at some point we begin to identify with them. And we say, oh, this is me. Yeah, I'm an angry person, or I'm this way, or I'm that way, or... Right? And we, we don't know who we are, and we get confused by this flow of emotion and feeling and thoughts, and we lose ourselves in all of this. We lose ourselves in all of this. And look, we have to realize that not every negative thought or uh, uh, that goes through our mind is us, right? The mind is, is, is always active. And there's an example of this. You know, when I used to, uh, years ago, I used to go to Greece, and when you, when, you, when you would fly into the country, I would, I would notice that there were always clouds over this or that. There were no clouds in the sky anywhere, but there were clouds over some of the islands. And I thought, it's summertime, there's not a cloud in the sky, why should there be clouds over these islands? It was odd to me. Then when I went to Mount Athos, I noticed that on beautiful, clear summer days, there was all, almost always 
a cloud. Sometimes it was perfectly circular, like a saucer, sitting right on top of Sonathona and a, and a sinefo, right? To Kalokeri, leo, deni parki alo sinefo, tina to brama, right? Pus egin and uh, and someone told me the explanation. It's very simple, namely that the warm air comes across the surface of the ocean. It hits the side of the mountain. It has nowhere to go, so it rises up. And when it gets to the top of the mountain, where the air is colder, it forms a cloud. So the mountain is really a kind of weather maker. The mountain itself ends up producing the clouds, right? And I thought, you know, that's exactly what happens with us, right? What, I mean to say that you are, all of the bad thoughts, that's just bad, that's, that's a cloudy day. But you're not the cloud, you're the mountain. See the difference, right? So we make the mistake of forgetting that we're the mountain and we end up living in the clouds, in the thoughts, and, and we don't realize that these are just things that are there. That's not who we are. They might be linked to us, they might be related to us in some way, of course, but that they do not express our deeper identity. You're, and, and, and from the minute I realized that very, very simple kind of meteorological situation, it was always very helpful because we do have rainy days in our minds and gloomy days and foggy days and right but that's not who we are and even even on a foggy day the sun is still shining somewhere isn't it right which is why the christian person who believes in jesus christ should never be upset i mean not not too much anyway right because we know that even when the clouds come in right the sun is still shining somewhere even if we can't see it so the first thing to do is to not identify yourself with your thoughts the other thing to do is simply, we have to, I mean, it's a good Christian practice. It's a good spiritual practice to, 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 to make a new habit now and, and stop engaging those negative thoughts. Stop engaging those negative thoughts. Don't entertain them. <clears throat> don't couple with them. Don't welcome them in. Don't, don't dialogue with them. We do this all the time. And we've gotten into the habit of doing it that we find it almost impossible to stop. I'm telling you, <clears throat> it's not impossible, and we don't have to do that. You know, the other day, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> the other day, it was early in the morning, and I went, to the, <clears throat> I went somewhere to, to do something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a colleague, somebody that I work with, made a kind of passive, aggressive remark to me. It was sort of one of these rude things that people say that it's a kind of a dig, but it's, it's a veiled kind of a dig. And I thought about it and I said, gee, well, I mean, why are they saying that to me? That's not, you know, it was, it was rude, it was offensive, but I didn't have time to deal with it because I had to go to a meeting, then I had to teach a class, then I had to go somewhere else, and the whole day went by. <clears throat> and by the time I got home, it was 8 o'clock at night. And do you know that that thought waited for me all day? All day that thought waited for me. I got home, right, it was the end of the day, and all of a sudden, I could, it was like I heard a voice, and the voice was saying, are you going to let him get away with that? Right? You know, and, and, and again, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's right, am I? And then, and then the, the, the voice, you know that voice, it says something like, you know, you know if, you, if you let them walk all over you, they're going to think you're weak, and they'll do it again. And then I, you know, I said, oh, makriya. I thought about it for a minute, I'm like, you know, I'm not going down that road. Right? You don't have to engage those thoughts. <clears throat> I could have sat there and worked myself up into a fury that evening, right? And I'll and indulge in revenge, and I'll get him, and I'll show him, and I'll call people up. Do you know what he said to me today? On and on and on, right? I'll drag other people. And as logismos, and as logismos, right? And I'm here to tell you that it's very hard. <clears throat> but you don't need to engage them. You don't need to couple with them. You don't need to entertain them. You don't need to invite them into your heart. You don't need to think about it like in biblical terms. They're unclean things. You don't touch things that are unclean, right? If you saw something on the street that was disgusting or gross, you wouldn't, right? But yet with these thoughts, right? The piano me amesos. Saint Hezekius of, uh, of uh, Sinai, <coughs> another saint from Sinai, we're celebrating John of Sinai tonight. You know, he has a wonderful image. He says, you know, the mind 
is like is like a it's like a lamb. It's like it's 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 like a a a, a, a young, innocent, almost naive kind of creature. Right? It doesn't doesn't really understand a lot. And the lamb is in the meadow, and at one point, this horrible beast, like a wolf or a dog or some ravenous creature, appears on the periphery of the meadow where the lamb is. And the lamb sees the creature, right? But it doesn't know what it is because it's a lamb. It has no experience of these things. And he says, not only does it not know what the lamb is, it thinks, not, I'm sorry, not only does the lamb not know what this beast is, what the wolf is or the wild dog, he says, the lamb thinks that it's its mother. And what does it do? It runs toward it. Right? The innocent, naive lamb runs towards this horrible, ghastly, right? And he says, in the real world, we know what happens when little lambs run in the direction of hungry wolves. We know how that story ends. But in the spiritual world, the story is not over there. And he says, the only thing the mind can learn from that experience, in other words, a foul thought comes into your mind, an ugly thought comes into your mind, a dark thought comes into your mind, a blasphemous thought comes into your mind, some... Right? The only thing he says you can learn by running toward that thought, by coupling with that thought, by, right, is the only thing you can learn is, is just how foul and how awful that thought is. That's the only thing you can learn from it. Right? And if you think about it, right, you think about the ugly and the awful, but the thoughts that we have sometimes. Mark Twain once said, every man has secret thoughts that would shame the devil. There it is. No one wants to admit that, but he did. And it's true of everyone. So we have to, we have to now commit ourselves to the inner practice of, of not engaging these negative thoughts. <clears throat> We've done it for so long that it's, it's a hard habit to break, right? I've made myself an angry person. I've made myself overeat, I've made, I, whatever, because I've been giving in to the thoughts for so long. And the, the thoughts became actions, and the actions became habits, and I became habituated into ways of doing things, and now I can't stop. Now, all I need is the thought, and the action follows immediately. Right? So <clears throat> everything starts with thoughts, and that's why the struggle is there on that uh, uh, level. So we say, I mean, the advice, the advice that we get in the monastery is, look, don't think about your thoughts, and don't think about not thinking about your thoughts, because if you're trying to think about not thinking about them, you're thinking about them, right? The idea is to simply think of it, think of the thoughts as sort of background noise or, or peripheral. You know, they, they could be things on your peripheral vision, right? I can see, I, I have my hands here, I can see them in my perif peripheral vision, but I'm not looking at them, right? So the thoughts are going to come and go. You can't prevent that. Thoughts come and go. But you, can't, you don't have to shine the spotlight of your attention on them. I mean, we're all sitting in church sometimes. Right? You could be online. Right? Σε αυτή τη στιγμή τι θα κάνεις, θα φύγεις από την ουρά, δεν θα κοινωνεί, όχι. Θα, θα, θα κάτσεις εκεί, θα προχωρήσεις, θα πεις, Κύριε Ιησού Χριστέ, ελέγχει σώμα, με, συγχώρησέ με, Θεέ μου, κοίταξε τι είμαι και ποιος είμαι και τι έχω μέσα μου. Right. Ουε. Right. Αλλά με τη δύναμή σου, Χριστέ, με την αγάπη σου, εγώ θα προχωρήσω. Εγώ ετοίμασα να κοινωνήσω, θα κοινωνήσω. Έστω και να έχω αυτό το λογισμό. Γιατί αν μπορεί ο διάβολος να σε, να σε διώξει από τον ναό, α, μετά right, έχασες το παιχνίδι. Right? So, I, I, told, I, told, I gave an image of, you know, we're, we're in church, often you could be online to receive communion, and that's when the devil tries to tempt you. You think about someone in front of you, or you watch someone else, or you have very, very ugly thoughts can come into your mind. Some people... Get out of the line at that point, if they can. That's the, that's the wrong thing to do, right? You just say, you, the thing to do is, I mean, you grieve over yourself. You say, God, forgive me. I mean, look at me. Look at the kind of man that I am, that these kinds of thoughts go through my mind. Who, what, kind of a, what kind of a person am I? Right? And you feel sorry. You say, you're cross. You say, God, forgive me. And, right? But you don't engage the thought. See, that's the difference. St. Isaac the Syrian says that 
The dispassionate man is not the man who has no passions. It's the man who doesn't act on them. See the difference? Right? Okay, the thought comes into my mind. Oh, I might, let's, say, let's say I'm shopping for a new watch. And uh, uh, the, 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 the man in the watch store puts out five or six watches on the counter. And then he turns around to get something else, and maybe the thought comes to my mind. I mean, it doesn't. I don't, I don't have this. This is not my particular problem. Maybe the thought comes to my mind, and it says, take one of those watches. I said, I'm not going to do that, right? Well, glepsis, pule. Right? So the, the thought can come. The thought, can, let it come, right? But you don't pay attention to it. You don't, you don't act on it, right? You don't act on it. Um... And, and the, maybe, maybe we can close with this because uh, I think our time is, uh, is coming toward uh, uh, the, the end. I think that you know, if you live in your mind, if you live in this world of thoughts, right, you will be confused, you will be disoriented, and God will be nothing more than an abstract idea to you. If one of these, if you're one of these people who rationalizes and intellectualizes and lives totally in your head your thoughts are going to be like flies buzzing around your head and god will never be a reality to you god will just be a concept that you might have an opinion about but no experience of right because god doesn't meet us god doesn't come to us on the level of our crazy thoughts right which is why the church teaches us to descend from the mind into the heart to live not from up here, but to live from the center of our being, from the core of όχι από το μυαλό, από την καρδιά. Η καρδιά είναι το κέντρο. Όχι το μυαλό, όχι το όχι ο κέφαλος. Right? The center of the person is the heart. That's the core of us. That's where we feel our guts. That's where we feel things uh, deeply. And if we live in our minds, as I said, we'll never experience God. We'll never know God because God is not up there in all of that you know, the attic of the brain or the mind that's filled with all this clutter and junk. God is a reality that is deep within us and deep within our center and deep within our core. And when we, when we, when we, when we get distracted and we find ourselves pulled out of ourselves into all of these thoughts, that's when we need to recall our energies, recall our self and enter that center place, enter the place uh, uh, of our heart and there not to just be idle as they say not to do nothing but to say right? to, 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 when you get to that place to say the Jesus prayer in other words if I'm troubled by thoughts don't think about the thoughts don't let them overtake you like that uh, St. Maximus the Confessor says nobly endure the waves of thoughts that will come crashing over you Right? That's the logism. The kimata of logism. Erkunde, erkunde, oenos metaptonalon. Right? He says, Yeneos, skate se ki. Right? Mi fovase. Right? Because he saw Vrachos, he saw Petra. And the thoughts will come. Ta spasun afta, ta figun afta. Afta ni ti stigmis. Ti stigmis in afta. And to find that center, right? That deep part of yourself. And to know that that's where you're connected to God. Not in all of this madness that goes on in our mind, and all the restlessness and the craving and the... We don't want to go to God here. The pragmatic of God, the parousia of God, is the end of the world. And those, in our bodies. What's the image they say? You know, if you look at a tree, if you look at a tree, a tree has branches, a tree has a trunk, and it has roots. And when the storm comes, when the winds come, where is the tree most agitated? Exoterica, right? All the, it's the outer branches of the tree that, right? That's the mind, right? All the thoughts, all that, that's, that's the person being agitated by, right? So, so what do you do? Where, I mean, if, if you're in a storm, you're not going to climb up to the top of the tree. You're going to go somewhere by the trunk, right? So when we, we should always do this, but especially when we feel uh, agitated, that's when we know that we've left our center, We've lost our center. We've left the place of the heart, and we have to go back to the core, to the
to the center, to the trunk of the tree, to the roots of the tree, because that's where the life comes from, and that's where the strength is, and that's where uh, the, uh, 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 our safety is, in a sense. I had many more things to say, but we had a Vesper service, and I think I've spoken for quite some time now. But uh, I don't know if there's still time for, do you want to do the questions and answers? So. Έχουμε και εκκλησία αύριο. Ναι. Yes, okay. You know, someone else, we spend a lot of time, I don't know, I mean, many of us spend a lot of time driving, and uh, there's this phenomenon of road rage, and, you know, we can get pretty angry or worked up when we're driving, and that's because we look at the other drivers as our enemies. <laughs> we look at the other drivers as if we're in competition with them, and I think that's a mistake, you know, it's because instead of looking at, like, the red light, the red light is your enemy, right? You, you, oh. It's, got, it's, it's been green long enough, it's turning yellow now, I better hit the gas, I can, right? God forbid, I'm stopped at a red light, right? The red light is not your enemy. The, the red light is your friend, right? The red light is telling you, stop, right? Stop, stop. Katsi di lifta, right? You did yaz say, right? Stop at that red light, slow down, stop at that red light. How long are you going to be there for? Seconds, right? That's where you can stop. Collect yourself. Think about God. Find your heart. Enter the place of your heart. Right? And then you go on your way. Right? In other words, think of all of the opportunities that we have in the course of the day to turn our thoughts to God. And instead of doing that, we're trying to run red lights. Are there any questions or... They're, they're, you're, yeah. Do you have, if you have any, you can give me now. I can uh, answer them. So. What do you have? It's like the Academy Awards. I'm waiting for the winner to be announced. Here, so. You want to, you want to pick them too. So. No. Yeah. Maybe we'll start with one, and then okay. I can pick you, up the you rest. Okay, do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it, or start with whatever, whatever you want to do? Yeah. How do you help your spouse that is not at happy or at peace with themselves? How do you get rid of negative thoughts? Well, I think I, I think I said. I mean, we, you, you, I, I think I answered the the second part. You really can't get rid of the negative thoughts, right? You can't get rid of the negative thoughts. The 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 real response, the real solution, is you have to you have to start. You have to stop engaging them, right? The thoughts are going to be there. It's up to us whether or not we, you know, the old, the old somebody said, you know, even, even on Mount Athos, airplanes fly overhead, right? And they make noise sometimes. And the thoughts are like the airplanes. But on Mount Athos, on Mount Athos they didn't build an airport, right? So, περνάει το αεροπλάνο, κάνει λίγο θόρυβο, αλλά δεν προσγειώνεται, επειδή δεν υπάρχει έδαφος, right? So the thoughts are going to come and go, but don't build a runway for them. Don't build a landing strip for them, right? Don't, don't, don't welcome them into your heart, no matter what they are, all right? The, other, the older image that people used to use was the image of the, the fly. The thoughts are like flies. And if you're sitting in the house and the windows are open in the summertime, right? And the windows could be the eyes or the ears or the senses, and of course, if the windows are open, flies are going to come into your house. And the fly comes into the house, and it, it, what does it do? It buzzes around the room a few times. And if the fly doesn't find anything to eat, or uh, it'll leave, right? Then you mess a miga, the risky tipo da nafai, ke pevgi, right? E ano mas tuspiti ne lero meno, ine vromiko, ine fayado, ke kike, ohi mono puta mini miga afti. Right? So you can't prevent the flies from buzzing into your mind, but you can create a, a pure environment within yourself that doesn't welcome or accept these things. The other question, all right. 
Why don't you try to pick, pick some that are most appropriate for the talk? Well, yeah. Another one? Well, I, I didn't answer the first question. I mean, about, about the spouse who's not at peace, okay? If I'm not at peace, I can't make you, I mean, how, how can I possibly, right? And the thing is that, I mean, we're all in different places too. And we have to, you know, when I went to the monastery and after I went to the abbot at one point, and I said, you know, copy i pateres in eligo discoli, right? And uh, he says, no, he says, que gote copatirisi afto. He says, look, he says, you, you want to know why you're here in the monastery? He says, you're here to put up with everybody else and they're here to put up with you, right? And it, that solved all the problems, right? So I, when it comes to other people, right? Look, just as sensitive, the pure evesti to pragma sto cosmo ini cardia. Η καρδιά του ανθρώπου είναι το πιο ευαίσθητο πράγμα. Λίγο να το πιάσεις και καταστροφή μεγάλη. So, we have to be, we have to be gentle with each other, we have to be patient with each other. Ο άλλος πονάει, ο άλλος πονάει. And if, αν δυσκολεύεται, ας πούμε, ο σύζυγος ή η σύζυγος, θε, θέλει πο, στο, στον άθρονα δεν λέμε καλή υπομονή, λέμε καλές υπομονές. Επειδή πολλές χρειάζονται. Right? So, There were a number of good questions, so hopefully uh, I do a good job, and if yours, if yours doesn't get chosen, I'm sorry. Uh, with all the excess and abundance in our everyday lives, and the delusion of the idea of ourselves, how can someone humble, the, humble themselves to look into the depths of their soul for their salvation? You know, they say that, they say that the devil tries to destroy us through our virtues, and God tries to save us through our vices, right? The devil tries to destroy us through our virtues. What does that mean? Let's say if I have a good voice, right? I'm a kalos psaltis, I have a foveri phoni. Afto ini mi areti, afto ini kati kalo. But, ego boron ne yinui perifanos, right? I mean, if I have a beautiful voice, I can become prideful. And the good thing that God gave me, the, good, the beautiful gift that God gave me, the devil will try to use that to destroy me. Right? And we see that all the time, your gifts, your virtues, they be, that, that's why they say you have to repent not simply of your vices, you have to repent of your virtues sometimes because you think you're good, you think you're, right? So I, as the devil tries to destroy us through our good qualities, God tries to save us through our bad qualities. And the, the, the difficulties that we have, the mistakes that we make, the failures that we, that we have in our life, our passions, this amartia esta pathi, right? Αυτά μας τα πεινώνουνε. Αυτά μας τα πεινώνουνε. Καταλαβαίνετε. That God, God allows us to be humbled by our, our, our own weaknesses. A right? person who has uh, a, pers a character defect or a character flaw, that's the, I mean, let's say someone who's an alcoholic, okay? That, that can be a potentially very dangerous and very damaging thing. And what do they say? That the person has to do what? They have to hit rock bottom, right? And then there's an opportunity for them to, okay, I realize now just how terrible this is, and I realize now that, I mean, this is done, I can't do this anymore, okay? So that's an example of how a vice, a passion, uh, uh, an addictive behavior, a self-destructive behavior reached a kind of a limit, and it became its own teacher in a way. Right? I can't live with this anymore. And God has, a, it's a blessing, right? And people say, how about some, sometimes people get diseases and they understand that they're blessings from God. They said, you know, I mean, the alcoholism was terrible and I, but I hit rock bottom and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Or when the, when the doctor told me that I, that I had cancer, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I wasn't living my life properly. I didn't know what was important in my life. My priorities were all upside down. And when, I, when the doctor told me what he told me, Τότε κατάλαβα τι σημαίνει η ζωή. Και ήταν ευλογία. Right? So, God, God is the one who, you know, will, will, will bring these things about for us. You have another one? You think the good ones? Time? Time is it's under your control. Uh, there were a few on this subject, so I think I'll consolidate them into one. Uh, what is the church's stance on secular teachings, on thoughts, self-development, etc. Can they work in tandem 
And I'll add that there was a couple in terms of the practice of physical meditation, yoga, etc. Okay. Well, when I, when I first heard the question, I thought it was about psychology. And I think that, I think, first of all, psychology is a very vast and variegated field. I mean, we refer to it, we refer to it with one word, but there are so many schools and of psychological thought that it's really, it's inexact to speak of psychology in general. But having said that, I mean, I, I'll do it anyway. Um, I think that, I think that uh, uh, the best that psychology has to offer is actually good and that many people have been helped by uh, counselors and psychologists and uh, psychiatrists. I mean, just as the body can get sick with the disease, the brain is part of the body and the brain can. I mean, there's obviously a certain percentage of, of people who have organic brain disorders or chemical imbalances. It's just part of the way we get sick. It's part of the way things go wrong. And those people can be helped by counseling and even medication. I think, at least in the US, we've gone way too far with this and we're over-diagnosing people with the smallest kinds of neuroses and problems and the answer to everything now is to, give everybody, to get everybody on drugs. Well, because the pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money and it's all like that. But, but if you look at the positive uh, uh, achievements of psychology and uh, psychiatry. I mean, we should welcome them because they do, they can really help people that can't otherwise uh, be helped. But having said that, we also have to recognize that psychology and psychiatry have their limitations. They, they're dealing with the emotional, emotional and the psychological uh, aspect of the person. And often, and this is the problem with medicine today, they're, they're usually just treating symptoms. Like they're not they're not getting at the deeper often there's a spiritual cause or there's something so i think i think there needs to be a combination of 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 uh of let's say the spiritual together with just like you know i mean if a person has a physical problem the priest wouldn't say no just go you know just go pray about it so, you know you go to the doctor right i mean it's a very it's a very simple we overcomplicate it i think the as far as the other things go meditation and yoga and I, I have a question about all of those things, and I question the appropriateness of those things for uh, Orthodox Christians or for any Christian. I mean, they present themselves as exercise, they present themselves as stress relief, and everyone's stressed out. Uh, but they are really, they are really the, they are the vestiges anyway of uh, the spiritual practices of another religion. The spiritual practices of another religion. And there are many yoga teachers who uh, uh, are attracted to yoga and they're attracted to Eastern religions and they'll teach their yoga class. They'll give people mantras. And I mean, it's not everybody does this, but some do this. But I think, you know, if you want to exercise, that's great. I would encourage you to exercise. I see no reason why we have to be going to other religious traditions uh, for, uh, you know, to, re to, to relieve stress. And I know that, I know, I know that yoga is popular and that many people uh, uh, go to yoga classes and uh, what I'm saying might be look, looked at as narrow-minded or obscurantist or negative, but uh, I genuinely uh, feel that way. I, I think that, uh, I just don't think that, I mean, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go to a yoga class. And how would you, what, how would you feel if I did that? What would you think about me? I couldn't go to a yoga and do what? And place my body and spirit in submission to and as guru, right? Someone who's going to tell me do this and do that, and what? What are they? You know, I, 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 my body is not my own. My body belongs to the church. My body belongs to the body of Christ. He must meli to Christu, to somatos to Christu. That's not my body to go now uh, to deposit at the at the feet of a spiritual teacher from India or Southeast Asia or okay, I, I know all, all all world religions have things of value in them. But I think to do this is to cross a line. I think it's to cross a line. And it's not necessary, you know? And actually, I read a book a while ago, I forget the title of it, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's about the history of modern yoga. And uh, the yoga that we're familiar with in the Western world is actually a fairly recent uh, phenomenon. It was invented in uh, India in the late 19th, early 20th uh, century by a group of Hindu religious leaders who were upset and concerned uh, about the presence of British Protestant missionaries in uh, India, because you had uh, lots of Indians were converting to uh, Christianity under the British, and these Indian religious leaders were naturally 
concerned about this. So what did they do? They came up, they created this whole system of modern yoga as a way to combat actually Christianity. Right? So, so uh, obviously yoga has roots in much older uh, Indian traditions, but the form of modern yoga that is practiced today goes back to uh, Vivekananda. I mean, there's a whole history here. We're not here to talk about that. But the very idea that it was created to combat Christianity is enough, I think, to, sh to, to make any Christian question some, uh, uh, becoming an adept, let's say, at that uh, uh, practice. So anyway, it's, it's a whole other worldview. It's a whole other worldview. I know I lost a few people with that one, but I was going to ask one final question, but because of that uh, father's answer, maybe we'll ask two and his grace will say a few words and we'll, we'll all go downstairs. Uh, how important is teaching hesychasm to young children? What could it look like in the household? Well, I think, you know, I mean, it, children learn by example. I mean, children, you know, we are our parents' children. What our parents did, how they behaved in the home, how they related to each other, I mean, that's, that's what we learn. What they tell us, that sort of goes in one ear and out the other. It's how do they say? They say, you know, I'd, ra I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. Yeah, have you heard that one before? Right, so who the parents are and how they live, that's what the children see. That's what they, they pick up on. And they're already genetically predisposed anyway because they're your children and, you know. So if, if the parents don't have a spiritual life, if the parents aren't people of prayer, if the parents aren't people of faith, it doesn't matter what you tell your kids. You're gonna tell your kid to go to, I used, I used to see this. Parents would drop their kids off to church for Sunday school. They would go and get pancakes and then pick them up. I mean, whatever they learned in the Sunday school, the real lesson was, right? Church is not that important because my parents don't go or daddy doesn't go or mommy doesn't go or so. And if you are that living example of faith and of belief, right, and if your heart is open to God, your children will see that even if you never say a word about it, your children will see that they will experience that God will take care of that. God will communicate to them. Of course you want to teach them and take them to church and right. But children are very sensitive too. And children, especially younger people, teenagers, adolescents, very, very sensitive to injustice and hypocrisy. That you smoke, right? The father says, you know, you shouldn't smoke. Well, you smoke, dad, right? They're very sensitive to the hypocrisy that fills our world. So, uh, I mean, raising children is, is probably the most important thing that any human, I mean, that, that's greater than anything in the world, to bring another person into the world and to raise that person right. I mean, that's got to be the greatest challenge. That's another life that, that God has given you for you to uh, raise. And, like, and if, that ex if the example isn't there, if the example of love and forgiveness and patience, and you know, now, now we have kids telling their parents what to do. I mean, the whole world is upside down. So uh, if the parents go to church and receive communion, and you know, the children will, We'll learn that and we'll follow along. Now, there might come a time, you know, we have this thing in our culture where the kids feel they have to rebel and, okay, they, they, they might do that. They might, I don't want to go to church anymore. But, you know, they'll come back. If you've given them, if you've given them that foundation, right, they will realize, you know, you know, my mother was right, my father was right, all those years, I, I didn't understand it, but, you know, right, because that's the right thing to do. So, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to be too heavy handed either. You don't want to be kind of, you know, imposing and forcing and, you know, sit down and say your Jesus prayers. I mean, it's not supposed to be punishment, right? But uh, at, at a particular point, I mean, you know, our children should learn how to pray. You know, they should, they should, they should know that they should experience the reality of God and they should experience the grace of God and the love of God and the compassion of, of God and the freedom and the joy that comes from knowing God. That's what prayer is. You know, prayer, people, you know, we have this idea about a rule of prayer. Nobody likes rules. I don't like rules, right? I'm an American. Americans don't like rules. You know, it's coloring in the lines and all of that. You know, to say it's a prayer rule, that's not necessarily the best way. Carnonas, I mean, it's a little bit different. In, in English, a rule, you know, you, you pray because, you, 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 you pray to God because you love God. Not because you have to or somebody told you to 
or it's a rule. Okay, sometimes it's good to have the discipline, but that's not the, that's not the motivation. <clears throat> Elder Emilianos of Simonopa that I used to say all the time, look, if I walked into a crowded room, if I walked into a room and there were 500 people in that room, and if there was one person in that room, one person in that room that I loved, where do you think I'm going to go? Right? I'm going to make a beeline for that person. I'm going to have to say hello to you and shake your hand. But my, the whole time, my mind is on the one person in the room that I love, and that's where I want, because I want to be, you want to be where love is. And that's what prayer is. You go to your icons in your house, to, not because someone told you to, or because that's what's right to do, or someone gave you a rule. You go there because you want to be where love is. That's where love is. You go where God is. And you go there so that your heart can rest in God and so that you can bask in God's love and be in that place. That's why you go. Now, you can't, you can't feel that way 24 hours a day. And so that's why the, a prayer rule is good because that'll keep you going. there. Just like in a relationship, not, not every day of, of, of married life is a honeymoon, right? And when the strong feelings of love aren't there, well then, okay, I'm still in, I'm still here, we're still together because we're committed. I don't just love you because I feel like loving you today. I love you because that's what, that's what we've agreed to do. That's who we are now. But, but we don't want to ever forget uh, the, 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 the real reason we come to church is to be with the Lord, is to be with God in that place of love. So. Hello, eh? No more questions? We'll go with one more. I'm sorry, forgive me. And that was a great answer. It's a great way to close the segment, but uh, I already said two, and I don't, whoever this is, hopefully they appreciate the Father's answers. I'm sure they will. Uh, once we quiet our minds, which kind of relates to what you were saying just now, uh, once we quiet our minds, what questions can we ask ourselves to find out who we are? Now, th think, about, think about the way that question is, is structured, okay? <clears throat> huh? Okay. I mean, the, the whole problem, first of all, is, is, is the way I'm thinking. It's all of these thoughts. So if I, if I kind of create a space for myself and I, 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 and, I'm, and, the, and I bring those thoughts into that space, it's still me, right? In other words, people say, Oh, you have to think out of the box. Have you heard that expression? You have to think outside of the box. The problem is what? The problem is that thinking is the box. How do you, right? How do you, in other words, it's that same voice. It's that same, who's asking those questions? It's that same sinful, it's the clouds that are speaking. Uh, if I take the clouds and bring the clouds down here. The, the idea is to be, is to be done with all of those things. In other words, when I stand in the presence of God, I don't have my thoughts there because if the thoughts are there, I'm not with God. I'm with the thoughts. They say, the thoughts, ilogismi, the thoughts, they're all thieves because they steal the idea of God from you. Right? In other words, if I'm with someone that I love and all of a sudden I, all these, I'm thinking about other things now, it's like I'm not there anymore. Right? So when we're with God, what we strive for is not so much, okay, I'm not saying don't think about yourself and don't ask questions about yourself. That's unavoidable. We do that. But in these deeper moments of prayer, that's not the place where we, what, to think about myself now? No, because you're with God. You're in the middle of that relationship. Yeah, again, Elder Emilianos had a great image. He said, let's say I'm walking down the road. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere walking on a path. And I'm going to my friend's house and I'm thinking, oh, how nice it will be at my friend's house. And he's made a nice meal and we'll listen to some nice music and maybe we'll watch a movie. And my mind is wandering and I'm imagining all of the nice things that are going to. And all of a sudden I look up and a, a few paces in front of me on the road, there's a lion. Right? He says, at that moment, I, I'm not thinking about the dinner and the music. And the, right? All I'm thinking about is the fact that there's a lion on the road. And it's staring at me. And now it starts to walk toward me. And the next thing I know, he goes, am I thinking about anything else? And now the lion is, a f is right, his face is right up to my face. Right? Am I thinking about anything else? Even myself. What am I, right? 
He can, then he says, and what if the lion swallows me whole, right? So the, the lion is God. When you're in the presence of God, right? Right? So, okay, I'm, I'm describing an intense kind of a situation, but that's the ideal, that's the, you know. And I think, to answer the question, I think that when we, when we put ourselves on a spiritual path, and when we move in the direction of God, and when we do the right things in our life, I mean, those questions will be answered spontaneously, right? Because in other words, my, I, I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't know who I am apart from God. I can't answer the question of who I am independently of God. It's only in relationship to God that I can discover who I am, right? What do we say? We say that the human person is the image of God. In other words, like a copy, like a, right, that, the, that the original is God and we are the ikones. Right? So how can you know the truth of the image if you don't know the archetype, if you don't know the source of the image? Right? If I have a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, I can't read it, I have to get the original. Right? So that's how I figure out who I am. That's how I come to know who I am when I enter more deeply, not into myself, but into the reality of God. So, is that the... You're gonna, you're gonna close it uh, Thank you so much, Father Maximus, for that uh, really uh, deep, uh, spiritual, enlightening homily and questions, uh, and answers to the questions from the parishioners gathered here this evening. Uh, I think we've all been very much edified during this uh, important Lent period, and we thank you very much for coming here from Boston, for making the time, and for enlightening us with your words and your examples, and of course, uh, strengthening our, our relationship with, with Christ above all. Um, I want to give the last word, and we're almost there, folks. Um, I want to give the last word to His Grace, Bishop Christophoros, who is also blessing us with his presence here today so that he can also thank Father Maximus and uh, say a few short words. Your grace. On behalf of His Eminence Metropolitan Sotirios, I would like to welcome Father Maximus to our metropolis and uh, to thank him personally, for his lovely speech about Logismi. I don't know if uh, the ancient philosopher Plato, who spoke about the word of ideas, if they have something related with Noimata. <laughs> I don't know, Father Maximus, if you have searched this area. The word of ideas which are eternal. And also, I know that on Mount Athos, when the monks go for confession, they don't say, I am going to confess, but I say, they say, I want to say my logismus, which is very important in the spiritual life. Also, I thank very much Father Fanurios, the pious priest, who organized, under the blessing of our metropolis, this spiritual opportunity in the middle of the great land, which is so necessary for our, to help us to grow up uh, our spiritual life in this holy period. When I was in Essex sometime, I heard Father Sofroni who spoke about Logismi. And what I remember from that speech is, if a priest is in the middle before the holy altar, and he accepts an attack by adaptation, what he has to do. He says, in this 
crucial moment, he has to pray to God and to say to him, my father, look at him. And you discuss, discuss with God. <laughs> so to avoid and to pass the temptation there. By this, he will be released from this temptation and he continues his service. Again, I thank Father Maximus who came to this Holy Church, which is connected with me personally, as he says that uh, his former name was Nicholas. <laughs> but also, I connected with this church because I have been ordained here as a bishop. 16, 17 years ago, <laughs> a long time. Thank you, all of you who came here, and I wish this holy speech to have roots in our spiritual life, especially in this holy land we pass through. Thank you. One more minute, promise. Uh, thank you so much, Your Grace. Um, everyone is invited downstairs in the church hall for some uh, charisma that the community is offering. And I want to thank the community council. I want to thank our philoptichos, who always work so tirelessly, as all philoptichos do across uh, our holy metropolis. You're all invited downstairs. Uh, for those interested, Father Maximus will be uh, celebrating the Divine Liturgy with Father Charidimos tomorrow at All Saints at Bayview, uh, south of Finch. So he'll be there for the Divine Liturgy. Also, for those interested, this, uh, this homily will be available through the Metropolis's Facebook and YouTube channel. So if you're not already there, uh, you can visit it. And of course, you can visit our Metropolis's website. And there's a special section there, not only for this talk, but also for Great Lent with a lot of spiritual nourishment for the entire Lenten uh, and Holy Week period. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for making the time uh, in this distracted world to spend some time here with us. Hopefully you were mentally here uh, along with physically. Um, I want to thank, of course, above all, His Eminence Metropolitan Sotirios, His Grace here, and of course, Father Maximus for uh, once again coming and uh, giving us such spiritual uh, recharge, recharging for our spiritual batteries. Thank you and uh, Kalianastasi.